So uh, we're really excited for this new series and this new season. Um, I always love new seasons. It's always a chance to kind of reset and restart. And uh, I think that's really important in, in gospel work and kingdom work for us to recognize the seasons of fresh beginnings and fresh starts because God has built that into our lives. So if you, don't, if you notice there's Dalton back there, everyone say hi to Dalton. Okay, so we're starting a new series called Rhythms, and uh, I, being a musician, I really love, uh, I, I always really wanted to play the drums, but my mom wouldn't let me play the drums because she said it wasn't musical enough, so sorry, dude, you can talk to her when she comes back. <laughs> Um, but so I ended up playing guitar, but I really have always loved the drums. I think they're a really cool uh, instrument, and they basically the basis of every all music. But so we're gonna play a little game today, if that's okay with you, because you know it's the new year and why not? So Dalton's gonna play a little rhythm, and then we're gonna guess what kind of rhythm it is. Does that sound good? Okay, great. So it's participation. You get a participation trophy today. That's what's wrong with kids these days, by the way. Okay, so Dalton, go ahead and uh, play the first rhythm for us, and we'll guess what it is. Okay, what kind of beat is that? Anyone know what kind of rhythm that is? What kind of beat that would be? You have to guess. What kind of beat? Nobody? A what? A fun beat? Yeah, style. Like what type of... Oh my gosh, musicians. Musicians are the worst. Style of beat. How about that? Style. Rock beat. Yeah, was that a rock beat? All right, good. All right, all right. Try another one. I know this is a little silly, but who cares? We're just going to do it. Go for it. Next one, yes, do it. Oh, that was awesome. I like that beat. All right, what was that beat? That's a, was that a punk rock beat? Close enough. Metal punk rock beat. Okay, good job, good job. All right. Next one. Fell into a burning ring of fire. Okay, what, how about that beat? That's a that's a cash that's a cash beat. Country beat? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I kind of drive in train country. Oh, that's the good stuff. Okay, yeah. What was, train trucks and horses. All right. with that one a rap a rap beat <laughs> we could beatbox you know. yeah, r&b R oh wow there you go gosh you're so smart i guess should we do one more is this silly enough okay good we'll do one more you're, you're leaving us hanging here buddy How about that one? I don't even know that one. What, what would you say that one is? That was funk. Funk beat. All right. Good job. Funk, guys. Come on. We don't know funk in Fort Collins, Colorado. I mean, what the heck? All right. Let's give Dalton a round of applause for that. I just wish I could play the drums. You should see me play the drums. It's embarrassingly funny. Um, so we're, <laughs> so I, I really like music. When I, when I was back in the day, uh, we used to play in rock and roll bands and we would record, I, they wouldn't ever let me do anything with rhythm because I had such terrible rhythm, I couldn't keep a beat. Or Dalton, when we have the click track, he's like, seriously, you can't even keep a simple beat. It's like, some people have it, some people don't, right? Um, but really, uh, this idea of rhythm, the idea of beat, is kind of built into who we are, actually. You know, think about your heart. Your heart beats at a certain rhythm and a certain beat. Everything we do is, it has rhythm to it. The way we breathe has a certain rhythm and a certain cadence to it. Even when you walk, you, most people walk at a kind of cadence. Uh, when we were backpacking this summer, we did about 30 miles, and, and uh, we just, you kind of get into a cadence. You kind of hear your, your poles and your feet, and it's almost, it's rhythm. Rhythm is built into our lives, right? And the way God has designed us as people and designed not just us as people individually, but our world, is he's built these seasons and these rhythms into our life. And they're not just accidental things that have nothing to do with our spiritual life, right? So like this time of year, we've, we're kind of in a reset season, aren't we? 
So end of Christmas and New Year's, we kind of we, we kind of build up to this holiday season's busy, it's family, it's excitement, it's the wonder of Christmas, and then we kind of settle in and then we reset for this season. So how many of you have New Year's resolutions? Anyone have a New Year's resolution? Okay. Do you want, do you want to share it with me? Better office work. So be organized. Okay, you and I, we should talk about this. I need help too. Okay, so... So, so it's, a, it's a season of reset, right? So there's four seasons in the year, and every season there's kind of a new thing that happens, right? So once spring hits, it's this, this fresh and exciting, school's ending, and then, and then we have summer, and summer's a whole different world, and then fall is the greatest time of year because it's football season. Oh, it's sweaters, it's the best life, right? Um, and so into our lives, God has built these rhythms. So over the month, I'm going to talk about a little bit about how do we grow through the rhythms of life that God has placed in our lives already. Okay, there's the things that are in your life. I think it can sometimes be hard to know, what do I, how do I grow in Christ? How do I grow in my relationship with him? But I think that God has really made it somewhat simple to see what he, what, the way our lives function, the way we live our lives, actually is built into that. So we'll talk about that. Does that sound okay? Thanks again, Dalton. That was really good. The funk beat. Wow. Okay, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for this time. We give you this, this, this month, this year. Lord, we, we, we don't want to just have a resolution that we do for two weeks and we quit, God. We want, we want to work. We want you to work in the rhythms and the, in the cadence of our lives, God, to do more than you could, we could ever think you can do. God, we thank you that each one of us here has a plan and a purpose that's been destined since before we were born, that you've given each one of us a, a, a new identity in you. You've given each one of us gifts and talents and, and the ability to be connected to you. So Lord, we just ask that we would have this year, when we look back in December of this year, we would see that, man, you've done so many things, not just in what you give to us or how you bless us, but in the closeness of what it means to be with you. So Lord, bless this time as we share your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Mark chapter 8. If you have a Bible, you can turn it to Mark chapter 8. Also, if you have the YouVersion Bible app, if you go to events, all the notes are in there, and you can cheat. It's awesome. Okay, so I'm going to read this scripture. So this is getting to the end of Jesus' ministry life. Um, this, this part of this story is found in, in two of the Gospels, and so we'll read, we'll read now. This is Mark chapter 8, 30, 27 through 38. So Jesus, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. So Caesarea Philippi is way in the northern part of Israel. If you go there now, you'll literally touch the barbed wire fence of Syria. That's like, that's Syria, okay? So it's way north, okay? On the way, uh, he asked them, who do people say I am? So he's with his disciples. And so they replied, some say you're John the Baptist, others say you're Elijah, and still others, maybe one of the prophets. They're kind of guessing, or they're trying to figure it out. But what do you say, he asked, who do you say I am? And then Peter, who's so famously ready to do something, whether it's good or bad, right? He answered, you are the Messiah. And Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. So in present day Judaism, the present day Jews at that time were waiting for the Messiah to come and restore Israel. So the Roman Empire had taken over Jerusalem. Take, they've, they basically were controlling the people and the Jewish people were waiting for this person, the Messiah, to come and restore all peace and to bring, bring, God, bring God's work and order back to the, to the country of Israel. So Jesus says, okay, don't tell, him, don't tell anybody. He famously did that, which we'll talk about another time. And then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and after three days he will rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. He said, get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. So there's this, this kind of, there's a story unfolding where Jesus, people are realizing, man, this is the Messiah. Notice they've been with Jesus for three years. And they've seen Jesus do all these miracles firsthand. So if in your life, if you're like, I don't know about all this, I doubt a little bit here and there, you're, you're in good hands, right? You're in good company. The disciples walked with Jesus, hung out with Jesus all the time. They still were not sure at times, okay? So finally, they're like, you're the Messiah. And then he, then he went to candidly say, this is what's going to happen. So they had known prophetically that the Messiah was going to come and be born of a virgin. And they, they knew these prophetic stories through the book of Isaiah. But then they were hearing firsthand, like, this is what's going to happen, Right? I'm, I'm going to be rejected by the people that I've come to save. I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to probably hang on a cross. I don't know what details he went in, but prophetically in, in the book of Isaiah, it talks about being hung on a tree. 
So there was the, and he talks pretty candidly and openly. Listen, this is what's going to happen. This is why I came. This is what the Messiah must do to restore all things. And Peter, who's always so bold, right, and so brash, he's, he comes and he says no, and then he, Jesus calls him Satan, okay, which is like, of all the things to be called by Jesus, it's Satan. Ultimately, Jesus is not talking to Peter, he's talking to Satan, because he realizes, and this is really important, that in, in us sometimes, it's, do you ever feel like it's not you thinking? It's not you talking. It's not you. I'm like, this isn't even me. It's like something else. So Jesus was looking past the person and actually talking to the devil and saying, no, enough of that. Then he says this. Then he called, the, he called together the crowd along with his disciples, and he said to them, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up the cross, and follow me. So he just had them say, no, you can't. We're not going to let you go and die. We're not going to let you go do the thing that the Messiah is supposed to do. And then he says, all right, come, you want to be my disciples? You want to follow me? You want to be a disciple is basically like a little Christ, right? Someone who's just following after the, the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior. And he says, those who want to come after me must deny themselves, pick up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their very soul? Or can anyone give, what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous, adulterous, adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in the Father's glory with his holy angels. So this is a pretty heavy-duty scripture. Like when we think about being a follower of Jesus, we talk about this is the best life, it's great. But Jesus is pretty clear. To be a follower of Jesus, it costs something. Right? I think salvation is the greatest gift ever. Free. Do you, it says, do you believe? Yes, I believe. Woo! Right? I think salvation is a very simple act. Okay? But being a disciple, that someone who follows and has shaped their life around the life of Jesus, it costs something. He says, you want to be my disciples? This is what you do. You deny yourself. You take up your cross and you follow me. See, I think sometimes we're like, I think we've made our spirituality kind of this nebulous thing. It's kind of like, I believe this and maybe I don't believe that part and, and I, 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 I want to grow, but I don't really know how. I know like even last year, we talking about what's your yes and amen vision? What's the thing that God has put into your life? And then we like think about, yes, I want to do that, but then how do we do it? How do we, how do, we do some of these things? And Jesus makes it really clear. He says, to be my disciple, to be like me, to follow after the follow and do the things that I'm doing today in the future, this is how you do it. You deny yourself. You take up your cross, and then you follow me daily. It says in the Luke translation that you to daily do this. And so when we talk about rhythms of life, God has given us a pretty clear picture. And it's not always exactly what we want. And it's actually counter to the culture that we live in. Right? To deny yourself. Everything in this culture is not denying yourself. It's getting what I want right now. Right? Every, I don't know about you. I feel it every single day. My kids want it. other day we were watching something on TV, which we don't watch TV very much. We watch iPads, right? Or streaming. There's no commercials. And there was commercials. And all of a sudden it was like, I want that. Daddy, I want that. Daddy, I want that. And I was like, whoa. We want it now, don't we? Or do you ever have it like buffer? And you're like, oh, stupid internet. <laughs> buffering 10 seconds, you know? Back in the day, you'd wait three minutes to watch your show again. Holy cow. And so, how do you be a disciple? I, wanna, I, wanna, I really want to help us practically this year say, how do we grow to become more like Jesus? See, as, once you accept him, once you receive him, once you have realized his love for you, then we start this journey with him. And this journey is not a journey. It's a journey of becoming who God has wanted you to be since before you were born. See, I believe that every person, and we've talked about this, has a potential that God has put inside of them. That every person, God breathed life into you. That he placed gifts and talents and purpose and impact into you. And you will never be fulfilled fully until you have, are stepping and walking in the things that God has placed in you. Ever. And you will search and you will scratch and you will try to find the things. But God has this thing, these things for you. And rather than just be like, what does God have for you? Go get them, tiger. God has pretty, laid it out pretty clear. This is how you do it. You deny yourself. 
You take up your cross and you follow. So let's talk about that. Deny yourself. Romans 12. This is a really happy New Year's sermon. So, um, Romans 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, this is one of, my favorite, one of my favorite verses, in view of God's mercy. So because we have received so much mercy, so much grace, so much forgiveness, because God looks at me and he doesn't see my sinfulness, he doesn't see my brokenness, he doesn't see my past, he sees the, he sees the potential and the hope and the life of Jesus in me, right? In view of that mercy, to offer your body, offer yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. See, the, the, the modern-day Jews would have understood living sacrifice. See, so to, to be atoned for sin or to be forgiven of your sin, you had to come and you'd offer sacrifice before Christ. And it was pretty gross, right? You'd basically kill and offer the sacrifice. And what they would do is they would lift up the sacrifice, the blood sacrifice, right, for the forgiveness of sins, and they would say, Here, Lord, this is, this is, this is for my forgiveness of my sins. Okay? Jesus came and was that sacrifice. So you and I don't have to sacrifice anything anymore. Praise the Lord. So then Paul uses this terminology, right? He says, you bring yourself as a living sacrifice. Okay, so the people at that time would have been like, wait a minute, a living sacrifice? That's that's like contrary to each other. Living and sacrifice are different. And he's saying, no, what you do is you come and you bring yourself to God. God, I bring myself to you. See, denying yourself is not, not having fun ever. Right? That's what we think. That's, what I, that's the way I grew up. Christianity was like, denying myself was not having fun. It's like, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't listen to this, you can't watch this, you can't drink this, you can't whatever this. You know, and I was like, wow, Christianity is boring. Denying myself is just basically being a hermit crab who doesn't do anything bad ever. Right? That's really not what denying yourself is. Denying yourself is coming to the Lord and offering your whole self to him. In view of God's mercy... In view of the salvation that you and I have given as a free gift, I come and I give you my life. Deny myself is that I no longer live for myself. I live in response to God's love and mercy. So I come and I offer myself as a living sacrifice. God, here I am. Here I am for you. It's this idea of surrender to Jesus. It's this idea of saying, Jesus, I give you my whole heart and my whole life. And that is, that is a radical change from the culture wants you to do. So the first step, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, if you want to experience the maximum experience of life with him, it starts with denying yourself. It starts with saying really bold statements like, God, I don't want my will. I really want your will. God, I don't want to just kind of be halfway in this thing. I don't want to just kind of believe in you. I, I, don't, I, I really want all that you have. And then what you do throughout life is you just try, you try to just step into that continuously. And the first step, how, how do we become like Jesus? How do we understand the rhythms of life? It's to deny ourselves. It's not that we don't have fun. Trust me. Actually, living a life with Christ is the most fun you'll ever have. Living a life in Christ is the most joy you'll have in your relationships. Living a life denying yourself and giving what, asking to do what God wants to, you to do is the most fulfilled you'll ever be. I've laughed more in my life, had more fun, and have been more silly than any time ever than when I've done that with Christ. And the culture has told you, if you deny yourself, it means you do not get to be like yourself. And the reality is, when you deny yourself, you become who God wants you to be. And that is who you actually are. So, deny yourself is trading what you think you want for what God wants. Okay? A lot of times those are somewhat similar or the same thing because God has put these desires in your heart and you have these desires and you're trying to figure out how to do them and they're actually God-given desires. And so deny yourself is not saying, okay, I will never like music again or I will never like kids again or I will never do this again because I'm denying myself. That's silly. But that's the way we think. It's saying the things that I'm passionate about, I'm passionate about because God has put them there and saying, God, I really want your way. I really want your kingdom to come in my life. I really want to surrender my life to you. And when you do that, then you become who you're actually supposed to be. Next thing is take up their cross. This would have been a weird thing to say, right? Because Jesus hadn't died on the cross yet. And to them, the context of, that makes sense to us, but in the context of this story, it doesn't make any sense. Take up my cross, what cross? What are we talking about here, right? Jesus would have been about, about, I think it's like three months or a couple, eight months or something like that, would have gone to the cross. But at this point, the take up your cross thing would be weird. Like, take up your cross. See, what Jesus was saying was, listen, my path that I just talked about is the cross. 
Okay? You have to pick up your cross. See, the purpose for Christ coming to earth was to die and to save and restore this world. Right? To, to, to glorify the Father and to restore the world past, present, and future. And so his cross, his purpose was to do that. God and each one of us have a cross to bear, right? And we think it's like this heavy, you ever see the guys walking on the highway with like the cross? Ever seen that, that guy? You're like, wow, that guy's hardcore. He's like, I met, we met a guy who was walking from New York to California carrying a cross. And he's like, he's taking this verse very literally. That's really good. That's, I'm proud of him. It doesn't, necessarily, it doesn't necessarily mean that you carry a cross, right? It doesn't, even matter. it doesn't mean that you have to die. It doesn't mean you have to sacrifice your life for the, the kingdom. It means that you have to do your purpose. Take up your cross. See, for me, my cross is not the same as your cross or your cross or your cross. The thing that you are called to do and called to become is not the same as the next person. It's uniquely designed in you, and that's the beauty of the gospel. God's going to speak to you differently. He's going to work in you differently than he's going to work in me, right? He's going to engage my heart differently than he's going to engage your heart. See, for me, I like, there's things that engage my heart that might not engage your heart. It doesn't matter. It's not I'm better or you're worse or vice versa. It's that God has placed in you something specific he wants you to be, be and become. And it's our job as we deny ourselves to say, God, I want your will, than to take up our cross, take up your own personal cross. In, in Corinthians, it says this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and the new is here. When you're taking up the, your cross is this new identity in Christ, right? Like, God no longer sees your brokenness. He sees the, the righteousness and the life of Jesus in you. It means that you have a role in the mission of Christ in this world. It means that he's given you gifts. He's given you talents. He's given you passions. He's given you leanings and desires. And you are to turn those towards the life and love of Jesus, Okay? You're, those are supposed to wrap around a kingdom mindset or a way that we're supposed to help and restore this world, help people see the life of Jesus. He's given you gifts to minister, to help reach people, to help um, do the thing that you want to do. If you have visions in your life, your gifts are probably tied to those visions. Okay? And so as you deny yourself, then you take up your cross. You say, hey, this is my part in this whole thing. I'm not just like it's just the pastor and a bunch of people. That's not how it works. It's the body of Christ. Each person has a cross to bear, so to speak. Not the cross. But like Jesus fulfilled his purpose on the earth through the cross, so we, we fulfill our purpose on the earth through the things that he's given us. Through the passions, through the people, through the family, through whatever it is that God has put in your heart. And that is uniquely to you. And you have to figure that out. And we will help you. But you have to land there. You have to, you have to allow God to speak and to reveal and to show you what are the things that you have part in this thing. What is your role in the kingdom in this earth? And that no one can do for you. I know you're like, well, the church should do that. Like, no. The church will help equip you to do that thing. The church will encourage you to go out and get it. The church will help you to define and refine and, and speak encouragement into that. But God has to speak that into your heart. And you have to say, this is who I'm supposed to be. And it might not be a specific career. It's probably more of a person that he wants you to be. I want you to be an encouragement to whoever you meet. I want you, you're, I want you to start this nonprofit or start this ministry or do this thing. Or I want you to have a, min, a, a heart for young people. I want you to have a heart for old people. Or I want you to have a heart for those who can't get to church or whatever. It's our jobs individually to, to see and to hear the voice of God. No one can do that for you. No one can tell you, hey, I think you should be this, right? I mean, we can draw that out, but you have to land on it. What is your cross? And until, this is my belief, until you realize what my part is, and it might be seasonal, like in this season, I really feel like I just, I'm just going to pour all of my love into my kids or my neighbors or my coworkers or whatever it is. But until you land there, you will feel incomplete because you're not becoming who God wants you to be. It's not because you're bad. It's because you just haven't, set, you haven't picked up your cross. You haven't seen yourself as part of the restoration story in this world. And, and when we do that individually, then it's profound what happens. And not that you aren't doing that, but that's something that no one can do for you, nor would I want to rob you of the intimacy that God can place that into you. Because God has shown me things that he wants me to become. 
And when God shows, shows that to me, no one can take that away. No one can make me question, because God said it. I've, I've given my heart and my life to him. And now, God, what would you have me do? How, what's, what's, my, what's, my, what's my role in the cross? How do I carry that? My prayer for you this year is just that you would see yourself in this story more and more. That you would see yourself as the redemptive work to your office, to the redemptive work to the people around you. And no one can initiate that for you. And all God has ever wanted to do is tell you those things. All God has ever wanted you to do is to partner with you to see his love go to the people around you. And it starts by denying yourself. Lord, my own agendas, my own plans, this is scary, trust me. My own ambitions, my own goals to the future, my own whatever I think I want to have, I'm just going to give those things to you. And that step of faith will dramatically change your life. He doesn't take those things away, but what he might do is he might realign the priorities of those things. And then when you and I can pick up our cross, we can pick up our portion in this world, then we can see some profound things happen. See, as a church, we've decided to not be very busy, to not have a lot of things. Hey, every Tuesday, Thursday, Wednesday, come to church and do this thing. No. That's how you sound if you do that. Because I just really believe that our job is not to keep Christians busy. Our job is to be the redemptive work to the people around us. And whether you've been a follower of Jesus for five minutes or 500 years, or whether you think you believe 20% or 100%, God will not choose to skip you. You believe 5%, he's good with 5%. Just keep giving your life to him. And we, we will never reach our potential as a church until we do that. And so many of you do that. This isn't like a coming down on you thing. But I know in my life I've never been fulfilled until I've realized what God has for me next and what my role in the cross is to be. And then the last part's really cool. So he says, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Oh, that's such good news, just so you know, guys. What does that mean? That means that Jesus has promised his presence in your life all the time. He says, you're going to take hard steps. It's going to be a hard step to deny yourself. Because I want what I want, right? I have, we have, as humans, this thing called selfishness, and it kind of wants to run the show, right? And if you, if you don't, then you're prideful. <laughs> Just thought I'd say that. But the, then you're going to take up your cross. That's going to be scary too. Like, oh my gosh, this is what I have to become. This is who I have to, I have to be like Jesus. I have to maybe try to be more light than dark. I got, you know, these things that we talk about doing. But then he promises this thing, follow me. That means that I will be with you. I will be with you. I will model for you. I will speak to you. I will whisper you. I will partner with you to help you become who I want you to be. Jesus says this, for even the Son of Man did not come to to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. God will never ask you to do something he never did. And then he promises to each one of you, and me, his presence. Okay, now follow me. Now watch what I can do. Watch how crazy this adventure can become. See, the reason why you and I are bored is because we've not done this, and we have no adventure in our lives. And we work eight to five, and we go home. And it's Saturday, sweet, we get to sleep till eight. And then we do it again, you know, we do it all again. And that's not adventure. That is not ultimately the life that Jesus has for you. I like sleeping in. Oh, it's glorious. I'm not saying you won't, but I'm saying like the, 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 the rhythm of the world is not the adventure that God has for you. Ro Romans 12 says this, then we're going to close. It says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So the, literally the pattern of this world is the rhythm of the world, the cadence of the world. And the cadence of the world outside of Christ typically is whatever I want, I want, and I, I want to get. And I will take and I will keep and I will serve me, help me, make my life easier, right? And the, way, the pattern of Christ is the opposite. How can I serve you? How can I help you? How can I give to you? 
and it's a selfless way of living. And God says, do not be conformed to that pattern, but be transformed by a new pattern. That means we set a new beat in our life, a new cadence in our lives. If I'm going to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow him daily as, as a discipline, it requires different cadence. It requires different rhythm. Again, these are invitations from God, not requirements. God will not love you any more or any less if you choose to do these things or not. Right? His son died for those who love and hate him. He still died. And so these are invitations. The beauty of the cross is not a mandatory requirement of God's favor in your life, but an invitation to God's presence more and more. So we're going to talk about this over the next month. Here's a couple things we're going to talk about. How, how do we, in the cadence of our days, our weeks, our months, and our year, shape our lives around the life of Jesus? Not just, hey, go get them this week, guys. God loves you, right? But what do we do daily? What do we do weekly? What do we do monthly? And what do we do yearly to help us to live out, I want to be a disciple of Jesus. I want to be someone who's living an impactful life. I want to be shaped into who God was wanting me to be since the beginning of time. So for the next month, we're going to talk about this. So you can put up the daily. So there's things, daily, daily rhythms, okay? Daily rhythms, these are invitations. There's going to be weekly rhythms that God has placed in our life. And actually, some things are really natural, part of our, our weeks. There's going to be monthly rhythms. Good job, Joel. That are a part of how we grow and develop. And then there's going to be yearly rhythms that are going to be part of how we grow and develop. So, we're going to, so as a church, some of these things we're going to help facilitate. Okay? Some of these things are your own decisions you have to make and my own decisions. This idea that the American church has become this kind of like, come and make me, help me do everything in my faith walk is never the desire of the church or the design of the church. The church is to take your walk with Jesus and help strengthen it together and help strengthen it out there to equip the saints, the saints of Jesus Christ, to do the work of the ministry and to encourage each other in that. So in our daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly rhythms that God has already placed in your life, okay? It's not going to be that hard. It's not going to be that foreign. Like, okay, i got to reschedule my whole life, right? i got to, like, we can't do soccer anymore because i got to do these things. It's like, no, these are going to be part of your life things. I'm just going to help you see them. I'm going to help give you a roadmap so that you can know, okay, how am I doing? Am I growing? Am I experiencing God? Am I becoming who God wants me to be? Because if you're not moving forward, you're becoming complacent, and that's not the life that Jesus has for you, and that is no adventure, and it actually will rob you of your joy. And so we're going to talk about that over the next month, rhythms of our day, of our week, of our months and our years, and how it's uniquely shaped around each person. And the beauty of what we're going to talk about is not law or legalism. Trust me, we do not want any of that. But it's an invitation. If you want what God has, here's a little road map to get there. If you want to become who God wants you to be, here's some simplistic daily, monthly, weekly rhythms to help you grow. Does that sound okay? Okay, you guys can come up. We're going to close. We're going to close with communion today. Are we doing okay? Everybody? Good. It's going to be a good year. You can tell, can't you? <laughs> it's going to be a good year. I want to read that last verse because uh, it's been uh, kind of haunting me over the last uh, three to three months or so. Uh, you ever read a verse and it kind of like sticks with you? Kind of like, almost like haunts you? Like you think about it regularly and you're like, oh. You ever have a verse that kind of like rubs you a little bit? You're like, oh, that verse is kind of tough. You know that if that happens... If you're like, I don't know if I like that verse. I don't know how I feel about that one. Or this one keeps coming to my brain. If that happens, that is the Holy Spirit talking to you. Saying, hey, I want you, there's something here I want you to experience. Something here I want you to remember. And this is the verse that's haunted me. It says, we read it earlier. It says, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. For what good is it for someone to gain the whole world? yet forfeit their soul. But what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? So I used to think that verse meant like eternity. Like, oh my gosh, my soul's going to burn or however we want to say it. And it's not, I don't think. It's about how you live this life. 
And I've, it's been haunting me because I feel like sometimes in my rhythms of my life, I'm like, if I do not do the things that God has asked of me, if I do not follow the path that he has for me, if I do not experience all that he has for me, I ultimately will forfeit my soul. I won't go to hell, right? But I'll, I will forfeit the most precious thing that I have in my life, and it's who I am in Christ. I won't become who God wants me to be, and I will actually forfeit the very things that God has for me. And that is terrifying. See, if in your home and in your, if you don't spend time with your wife and you don't hang out with your kids, you don't invest in them, you forfeit your family, right? If you like eat chips all the time like I do, or you don't exercise, you forfeit your health. And if you do not experience God's love and walk with him, you forfeit your soul. Not for eternity, but in the fulfillment that he ha- wants and has for you in this life. So I just, this is a great day just to reset our hearts, to resurrender. We're going to take communion now, and just as they sing, you'll be able to come up and just sit down and take it. You don't have to be part of this church. I don't even think you have to be a follower of Jesus to take communion. It is the invitation to the world that Jesus died for you and loves you. And so uh, we're gonna, I'm going to pray. And uh, you can take communion or take it and sit down and take it as you feel like you want to, but use it as an opportunity to say, Lord, I give you my heart again. Your body and your blood was shed and broken for me. And in view of that mercy that I was given, I give myself to you. Now, God, let's go. So I'm going to pray. And you come and take communion as you feel comfortable. And then we'll close. Jesus, we're grateful for you. Lord, I pray that in the freedom of the Holy Spirit, we would see these these things as not actions to gain your value or your worth, but we see them as invitations to relationship, invitations to hope, invitations to fulfillment and impact. So guys, we take communion and help us to center and reset in our hearts. We thank you for your body that was broken for us. For the, for the healing of our souls, the whole healing of our hearts, the healing of our bodies, the healing of our minds. And we thank you for the blood that was shed for us, for the forgiveness of their sins, that they would break the chains of bondage and that they would set us free to experience all you have. So as we sing and as we take communion together, I pray that you would reset our hearts to you, that we would fix our eyes on you, and that we would look at this year as an opportunity to become all that you have for us. And we choose not to forfeit our souls. And we love you, Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. As we sing, why don't you come up and we'll take communion and then we'll close. If God was still standing